thank you. When I was 15 years old, life felt vivid. I had a great group of friends. We lived in an imaginary world, and I loved talking through the fine details of our imaginary future adventures we were going to have. They often involved us being swept out of our hometown, Witton, which is on the outskirts of London, a commuter town with rows of identical-looking mock Tudor houses, where on Sundays, grandparents would come over for roast dinners and people would be out pruning their roses in their front gardens. We would be bored on Sundays. They were usually very boring days. And we would retreat to our bedrooms and dream up more imaginary adventures. I remember one in particular. It involved us being swept away by a group of handsome young men who owned a Marigold VW camper van. They were going on a tour of the world and would ask us to join them. We would, of course, say yes and join them immediately. We were going to be the touring breakfast club. Judd Nelson was going to be joining us, as was the lead singer of The Cure, Robert Smith. We were wild with excitement. During this time, whilst we were enjoying being young teenagers, my good friend Nadine got ill with cancer. We dealt with it in different ways. We used to giggle at the wigs she would wear into class and have a go at wearing them ourselves. We would also go to visit her in the centre of London, in hospital, where she was having her treatment. There, even as she lay exhausted from chemotherapy, we still discussed our imaginary future adventures. Boys who we were going to fall in love with, possible career paths, places we were going to travel to. It was a way to make her better. Two years later, when we were 17, our dreams shattered and fragmented. I received a call from her parents on the 1st of December, 1991. Nadine had died. She had died of cancer in hospital peacefully. As a way of dealing with her death, I stayed in touch with her parents. I would pop in for a cup of tea, and they would offer her bedroom as a place where I could go to remember her, a place where I could sit in her magnolia-painted room with her posters of the Chippendales and soft toy tigers. But when I was 17, I didn't really want to do that. I didn't want to go to the room where we giggled and planned so much stuff. It would be much later on that I would return to her room. When I was 24, my mum died. And after her death, I suddenly began to realise a little bit more about what loss meant. The way the meaning of a place could change because those who used to be in it were no longer there. The need to capture these lies, to stop them from vanishing altogether. Ten years after my friend's death, Nadine, I returned to her room and began to photograph it, what was left of her, the details of her young life. I'm a photographer and artist and didn't realise at the time that I'd started a project that was going to take me 12 years to fin finish. It is this project that I want to talk about today. This is her room. Just before she went into hospital for the last time, she tidied and rearranged her room. This was a hugely significant event because it meant that each object had been carefully and definitively placed. At first, the room wasn't dusted. The dust acted as a mapping device so that if you picked something up, you knew where to put it back down. This was the first room I photographed, and the parents allowed me as much time and access as I needed to. I realized photographing from the doorway using natural light was the least intrusive way I could photograph these thought-provoking spaces. I became interested in these spaces. I wanted to explore how these rooms allowed people to remember, adjust, and heal at a pace that was right for them. It was also a means for me to come to terms with my mum's death. Somehow, these parents and I shared the need to talk about what had happened. Some rooms came to me through word of mouth. Others were responses to, to posts, research posts I'd made on bereavement websites. Slowly, very slowly, the project began to grow. I photographed each room, and I listened to the parents tell me their stories about their children's lives. After I, would, after I photographed the room, I would send the contact sheets 
and the print from a chosen negative. The act of sending the print meant that they had an image of the room as it was when I photographed it. They had a photographic copy of that moment. This is an important point to the project and reflects how I titled the work. Died 11 years ago in 2005 refers to that exact moment that I took the photograph. This room came to me after 11 years um, after their daughter had died and changes had already occurred. In fact, the mum was now using it as an art studio. It is this point that I wanted to emphasize that changes do take place. These rooms are not static. They are one moment in a much bigger process. These rooms, these images do not capture the changes take, that take place, nor the rituals that occur. For example, the daily drawing of curtains, candles that are lit, the longings that are given away, stored, or recycled. Nor do they capture that however many years pass and however drastically the room changes, it will always belong to their son or daughter. The lack of text surrounding the image is also deliberate. I didn't want to reveal who these people were, how they died. I wanted the images to tell us these stories. When I was interviewed in Vice about this uh, project, parents from all over the world began to contact me. Parents from Africa, America, Australia. They contacted me to tell me about their rooms. The world has rooms. Places that can't be gotten rid of easily or quickly. Places where time slows down and change, change takes place gradually. Some rooms came to me many years after their son or daughter's death. Others were quite early on. This room, there'd been, sorry, there'd been two years since their son's death, and the room had already changed into a computer room, an office space. Yet despite this change of use, the color of the walls was still the same. There were stickers on the windows that had not been taken down there were still reminders of who this room once belonged to. <clears throat> this family were moving, circumstances dictated. We spoke about how difficult that idea had been to be leaving the room, be packing it up. They were describing that on the one hand, there was the possibility of a fresh start, yet on the other hand, there was the cruel reminder that she was not going to be part of it. Bedrooms would be reallocated, and she would not have her say. This room had been largely dismantled already. It had been packed away into a blanket box. The blanket box would be the container and the protector of all the room, important things in the room. There had been 22 months passing when I came to this room. The mum described how difficult each month had been to get through. We discussed the title together, and that's why we decided to call it 22 Months. She also told me that her friends had begun to encourage her to start clearing the room, that it couldn't stay like this forever. She'd been thinking about that idea when she was in the bathroom, and she opened a cupboard above the sink, and a tube of eczema cream fell out. The tube of eczema cream was only needed by her dead son. Nobody else in the family suffered from eczema. She picked up the tube of eczema cream and she replaced it and closed the cupboard. And she said to me that if she was in no position, she, if she wasn't able to throw away the tube of eczema cream, she was in no position to begin to start clearing his room. She cried and laughed at the absurdity of it all. A child's bedroom contains their life tapestry. It is their sacred space. Within these walls are belongings that reveal who these people were, what interested them at different ages. For example, the, the position of the walls, sorry, the color of the walls, the position of the bed, the arrangement of belongings on shelves, all give us stories of who these people once were. I imagine that these stories 
continue throughout the house, but not just in the bedrooms. So, you know, that could be, that was the favourite position of their son when he watched television. That was her favourite cereal bowl. But there is something about the bedroom that allows time to slow down and become less linear. Enfolded within these spaces is a sense of fear and unease. What, would it, what, what if it happened to you? What would you do? But these rooms, these experiences do happen, and these rooms are around and exist in people's family, in, in family homes. They create meaning that may not make any sense. Excruciating, indeterminate. They also create a space from which one may reform and recover. A place from which you may emerge as a changed self. I'm really interested in the philosophy of Deleuze Kantari. <clears throat> they describe how thinking is like a synthesizer. Just as a musical synthesizer takes sounds and alters their frequency, intensity, and duration, thinking or thought maximizes rather than reduces the complexity of sensations. These images can only suggest the complexity of sensations that these families feel when they enter the room. One can only imagine how time slows down. One can only imagine the smell in the air, the sounds, the soft sounds of movement outside. <clears throat> These rooms do not operate purely as a visual experience. There are many non-visual sensations contained within these rooms too. It has always been my wish to push the representational boundaries of the photographic image so that we don't stop and look at the appearance of things that we think about and we go beyond the photographic surface. These parents contacted me 11 months after their daughter's death. A few years later, they contacted me again to say that the room had changed. It was now a place where their grandchildren came and hung out and listened to music. Their daughter loved music. In 2011, I returned to the room and photographed it. On the wall of the room was the photograph I'd taken in 2005. Somehow, I realized that these photographic prints had a different significance, a new significance that I hadn't considered before. With these images, the parents can potentially look backwards and forwards and keep themselves moving and evolving. So, the Rooms Project started in 2004 and ended in 2016, 12 years later, it feels quite different. For a start, I, I needed it to come to an end. It feels okay that it's come to, come to an end also. I somehow needed to move on. It has also taught me that death changes the living and that there is something quite beautiful about the ways in which we hang on to things to remember the people that we miss and still love. And so we didn't get to go on our tour of the world in that Marigold VW camper van with all the cool kids, but we did have her, our adventures. Photographing Nadine's room made me realize that bedrooms, rooms contain life. And it is the careful consideration of these lives that takes us on complex journeys of grieving and healing. Thank you.